and all. You, you guys just let me know when you're, you're ready to start because it is two o'clock. Now, okay, so. yeah, we're ready. Yeah, we're ready to go. Yeah, we are now. Recording. All right, all right. All right. Everybody, sure. everybody hear us? All right. Now okay. we're going to ask everybody to stand up and move close. No. <laughs> so um, this is a talk that Brandon and I have basically discussed in person ad nauseum. Um, never presented it, and we're going to do it in a different way. So rather than have a long set of drawn lecture slides like college, we're actually going to engage a dialogue with all of you. Um, we're going to present what we think is the problem and how we see the solution, but we want to ask you, you know, what are the challenges you're having? Any technologies you're aware of to to help us out? You know, uh, you know. Yeah, we really want to kind of get get a dialogue going of what what everybody else thinks the potential solutions to some of the data breaches we've seen over the last several years. You know, as we say in our pro, that the problem is you spend all this time and effort putting up all these castle wall defenses. Somebody gets through it trivially, and now you're completely exposed. Once you're on the inside, you're trusted. There really aren't any controls on the inside to stop people from exfiltrating data or moving within the network. So we've kind of, over the last couple of years, Mark and I have kind of chatted about this. Like, you know, how do you stop people from doing that? How do you segment your network properly? So a lot of that just kind of came out of, this presentation came out of those discussions over the last several years. So we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll get going. So I'm I'm Mark Jaquis. I've been doing a lot of uh, security engineer work for... A uh, number of years. Um, as you can see, I, I don't have any friends that eat salad. Uh, Simpsons reference, if anybody gets that. Um, but yeah, so I've worked for a number of defense contractors, um, civilian space, D Department of Defense, things like that. Um, we've seen a lot of different networks. We've audited a lot of different networks. We've done a lot of CNA efforts, if anybody is uh, familiar with uh, that kind of work. So that's kind of where we've seen. We've seen a million ways to do it wrong, and we think we have a better idea of what the problem is. So, but we definitely are open to, you know, talking with you and seeing what your issues are and what your experiences are. Yeah, so I'm kind of in the same boat. I've done a lot of IT security work. My background is in uh, digital forensics, uh, kind of breaking down malware and seeing how things work and what happened and where and how it worked, and looking at uh, network traffic flows and trying to figure out, you know, Somebody got in this box, and they moved data from here to here, and then they got in this other box, and they moved data out to this other place, and then it got exfiltrated to China. So, um, traditionally, the uh, IT security has always been focused on having strong castle walls, put up a big firewall, maybe an IDS or a spam filter or two, and you're secure. That's kind of been the going mantra over the last decade or so of, well, you know, we have firewalls, so we're good configured any any, but whatever, it's there, and the auditor signed off on it, so we must be secure. So, idea is, you put up a bunch of walls in a moat, and you keep the Black Knight out, and everything's good. But, it's pretty trivial to get past those defenses. You know, we were actually sitting in a presentation the other day, uh, talking about massive firewall deployments, and people really don't know how to manage it, and you look at your firewall rules, and you have 10,000 rules, and nobody knows, well, is this working, is it not working, if I, can I reach this IP, can I not, what, what's going on? And now you're in an organization, you have 10,000 end users, you have 15 firewalls in between everybody. Nobody knows what the rules are. Are they permissive? Are they too permissive? Is it too... Nobody knows. So firewalls just aren't going to cut it anymore. So um, our problem is firewalls aren't going to cut it. Just having a strong outer defense isn't going to cut it. What do you do? So our solution is you start segmenting your network and start distrusting some of your end users. You know, I don't know how many people have a lot of end users, but your users click on any email you send them. You know, they're going to visit some weird web page, and all of a sudden they got Angular Exploit Kit on their box, and they're starting to, you know, download Crypto Wall. Now you're locked, you know, you got a bunch of users locked out of their, locked out of their computers all day. It's an IT nightmare. It's a security nightmare. It's a help desk nightmare trying to fix everything. And now you're losing time and money and the business just, you know, that's not going to be tolerated anymore. So our concept is, why don't we just stop trusting our users? Put users on a complete, either completely separate VLAN, put them on a completely separate internet access, just have Comcast come out to your office, run a business line, they're not even cutting your corporate network anymore. So you can just run that as if it's the wild, wild west, have your users VPN in and out as needed to get to whatever core services they need. So that's kind of the first of, uh, I did brainstorming ideas of what we thought about how to like stop trusting your users. 
Just because they have a device that's on your network doesn't mean that they're trusted. If your users are in a bring-your-own-device environment, or they bring the device home, or they're set up in a coffee shop, they're downloading whatever, they're not even on your network anymore. There's no Any protections you did have are now no longer there. And then they're bringing the device back onto your network, and it's infected with all sorts of junk. And now you're spreading that through your corporate network. So, so what we're basically proposing is... You put your walls up around your critical IT infrastructure, and your users are not that. Your users are the vulnerability. They're the weakness to your network, and you should no longer trust them, period. So the key is is you essentially put up your perimeters. You make people VPN into the systems that are specific to them doing their job functionality, and you monitor everything through an individual port, usually a web. You know, everything's going to a web-hosted application these days. So it's trivial to put up a perimeter and only authorize port 80 and port 443 as access. And then you can secure everything that way. You don't have to worry about somebody connecting to your network that has a vulnerable system that is now phoning home to, you know, some malicious, you know, end person in China who now can just transgress through your network and go, oh, look, there's a server over here that has all this information. Think about it. Sony, any of the major breaches, Sony was probably the biggest one. Sony, they got access to the CEO's email. They got access to movies that hadn't been released, anything like that. And it was all because somebody was able to break in, likely through some spear phishing activity. And then they were able to go anywhere because they were considered trusted. They have no internal defenses. So what we're basically saying is stop trusting the people that are going to make you vulnerable and go forward. So that that's kind of our, our proposal. Now we want to engage in a dialogue with all with all of you. We want to know what are your thoughts, what are your experiences, what are your biggest challenges in managing and securing your network? So does anybody, you know, have anything that they'd like to, yeah. So we'll start with you. Um, it's... The information I'm getting from my sources is saying that spear phishing and phishing in general is the major issue. All right, so you're saying uh, spear phishing is the biggest issue that you're seeing from your sources? Yeah. Okay, I just want to repeat it for the yeah for the people, people online. Okay. So. online. And um, I like what you said about yeah, you know, we'll stop trusting the users, but we've got to get them to the resources and be able to keep it up. Uh, keep them on it. And segmentation is good, but when you get into some, you know, you're getting into larger networks, man. I mean, God, how are you going to keep these segmentations up? Do you got any type of scheme that you've come up with how to handle? Yeah, how one. To track it? Yeah, and, and the. For the people online, it's the question is: is how do you come up with a scheme to limit or at least track, you know, what your network segmentation is? And actually, what we're saying is, is find out what is important. Find out what has your information that will, if this is if this is leaked or if this is compromised in any way, your business is no longer functioning. So identify. It's all risk based. Identify what is the most risky information. What you actually need to protect, and put all your efforts on protecting that. And then outside of that is where you have your untr untrusted networks and your users, you know, they, they connect through the internet rather than through an internal network that doesn't have the adequate protections. But you're also still going to have to rely on, on the firewall to do some level of that. But you no longer have it just on your border. You're protecting what is the most critical of your assets. And it should actually allow you to pare it down to a smaller amount if you consolidate it into multiple data centers, if you have a large organization that needs redundancy, things like that. Or you host it in a cloud, you know, a cloud platform to try and allow you to, you know, at least have one central area that you know you have to protect. That's that's what we have, but it, we're open to other technologies. If anybody has any other suggestions or thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, the organization I work for, we've uh We've got about 400 employees, but we've got about 8,500 endpoints, because we have about 100 different web applications. We're already doing something very similar to what you suggested. Um, the production applications are completely segmented off. You have to, in order to work on them, you have to actually physically plug into the switch. They have their, they have their own internet connection. The main internet connection for the rest of the, of the agency is run, but we have, I think it's about 85 different VLANs. They're all segmented specifically based on what your 
what you're supposed to do. So, so what you're saying, you have a, a highly segmented network that's kind of users are grouped based on job function, based on what they need to get into, and your production stuff is more or less air-gapped, unless you're actually physically uh, hardwired into it. Yes. Okay. With the exception of the PSYOPs team. The PSYOPs team runs both... Uh, Basically, they, they, they monitor and run everything for both the production and the internal organization. And so they're, they have their own VLAN, which has access to everything. But like the developers, the developers can't touch market. They're yep, and that's one of, the, one of the thoughts we had is you segment everything by job function. There's no reason, if you look at like an, an accounting firm, they have segmentation of duties. So the people who run accounts payable and the people who run accounts receivable are two different people. And you don't want to ever cross those streams because people can just start paying and receiving money back and forth. We have to do the same thing with the, with the network. There's no reason that if you look at like a target breach, the target breach happened because somebody got into their HVAC vendor and their vendor was trusted and on the inside, got into the HVAC vendor, and then they were able to talk right to their POS systems. There's absolutely no reason that your HVAC system should be able to even see your POS systems. And that's the kind of stuff we're talking about with this, yeah. is that you need to get your network pared down to the point where your end users can only see the services that they need to do in order to complete their job. And we're not saying it's going to be easy. You really need to sit down and think about it and think, okay, this group of users only needs these, these services, and this group of users need th these services, and you need to be able to track all that. And it's a very difficult job to do, especially for a legacy network where you have 10,000 end users and everybody kind of over the years, you build up a lot of cruft, and everybody kind of has access to everything. Do it step by step. Yep. yep. As you add new users and replace old equipment, that's that's how the organization I work for. They they decided about six years ago this is what they wanted to do. They knew they couldn't just sit down, examine everybody, and implement it. They implement it step by step. I mean, it's that old cliche: the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Mm -hmm. So as you New employees came in, they were added to the VLANs that were put in place, um, existing employees were moved yep. in very small increments, and now it's once, once you have that framework in place, it's very easy to maintain it. The problem is getting that framework in place in the first place. Yep, yep, yeah. So you're saying that like you kind of built it step by step over the course of probably several years, I'd imagine, where as new users are brought in, they're brought in that are new, the new paradigm, and then as the old users are moved around, they get moved into the new paradigm uh, kind of as needed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we've talked about, and we're, we're not here to sell people on cloud services. That's, yeah, we're trying uh, that's to keep an, this uh, technology agnostic but as much as possible. having somebody else host your email does take a, a substantial amount of uh, resources away from, y you know, you. If you have Google or Microsoft's you know, cloud email service, you now no longer have to have your email server sitting on a network that everybody can talk to. It's not a single point, uh, you know, vector for people to communicate to. It actually allows you to then not rely upon email as, you know, as the collaborative initiative. You can share, you can use things like a Google Drive to share documents. So no longer do you need localized file storage for your end users. They can store things on these, you know, I, on a, a server that then now is, now allows them to not have to worry if their machine's compromised, you don't have to worry about you know um, somehow recovering a bunch of files that are now missing because they you know a crypto wall gets on there or something like that. It's a, it's a potential solution, but it's not for everybody, and we understand that. And that's yeah, the not challenge. all organizations are going to be able to do that, and a lot of especially government organizations aren't comfortable with some third party having access to all their data, but. Google has been certified under FedRAMP to be able to do some of this stuff, and they will stand up a separate uh, instance of Gmail or whatever for various government clients. And there are several government agencies out there that, that are doing this. Yeah. Having worked for multiple government agencies, they would actually be far better off letting someone like Google. Yeah, and yeah. we've actually seen the same thing. Um, hey. Yeah. That we see the challenges of them being able to man manage their own, even just spam filters, things like that. You know, when you have an entire collective of users using the, a product, you get a lot more insight into what spear phishing attempts are. You get a much better, you know, I guess, vision into what the attacks are coming. They can, you can stop them across a global 
situation then. And you can rely upon somebody that, honestly, if Google or Microsoft gets compromised, you've got much worse things. I mean, they're, they have an inherent vested interest because it's dollars per second if they have to shut down their service. They're going to do a much better job in a lot of situations. I mean, never mind the embarrassment of them having to explain to all their customers, eh, sorry, lost all your data. What are you going to do? Yeah, it's... Just ask OPM. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yep. You know, and, and that's another one of those situations. OPM breach, you know, basically led to another government agency becoming breached as a result, you know, and because of clearly, you know, I guess it's speculation, but network segmentation didn't work there. If one breach caused the breach of another organization, then there's clearly a problem there. And it's an, it's just another one of those situations where this this is a solution that's not easy, but it has to it has to come out. It has to be a way of, of looking at it because right now you can have, you know, we work for a couple, you know, different organizations that have millions of tools to try and track security, but they can't manage the tools. It's, it's become, you need managers to manage tools and it's, it, you know, you think you're secure because you've paid 20 million for X server and 50 million for Y, but it doesn't provide any security if you can't actually utilize that information. So. Uh, you got another question over yeah. here. So, network segmentation, in my mind, is, is another extension away of the old model of we had the big walls on the outside, now we're just going to build more walls on the inside. Right? And kind of what I see it is more of protecting the data. I don't yep. care about my network, I don't care about the systems, all I really care about uh, is... is yeah, and that's exactly... So, yep. what are you saying? We've gone away from trying to protect devices and but actually moving it to protect your data as opposed to worrying about all the right. ancillary users and trying to keep everything up to date. And, to and that's what, what we're talking about. I 100% agree, particularly with OPM. The problem is more of a policy issue. So if you, if you assume that you will eventually be hacked because it's too easy... Yeah, for the assumptions you're going to be hacked, yourself, yes. Maybe they didn't necessarily need to hold. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of companies are doing that. Like, because of the big data, they want to know everybody's credit card, home address, and mother's maiden name. Maybe they shouldn't have that for their, their risk migrations. Yeah, and there's certainly a risk based approach to some of this that, you know, you look at like Target, they were using credit card numbers as unique identifiers for individuals so they can then sell them more stuff. But because of that, they then get breached and all this data walks out. Now, I don't know how much money they made off of selling them additional stuff. Maybe it's more and they just don't care. You don't know. But that's something people need to start thinking about is what's the value of having this data versus the value of not having it. That's an organization I am. We, uh, last year, we had about $9 billion of credit card transactions run through all of our various apps. And what he's saying is very important, and they address that. Just actually recently, but within the last year, and the policy that we decided is you have to maintain these records for fraud's sake, but they don't have to be locked. Right. Yeah. So what happens is every three months, all of the transaction records get dumped into basically multiple copies on multiple hard drives, basically. I, I use the term hard in... Uh, so it's kind of cold storage. You don't just have a stack of hard drives. Yeah. But they have redundant backups that are entirely offline. Yep. And if they need to, they can be pulled, they can be examined. So just... And the theory is to store up to seven years and recycle out as needed. Yeah. But there's only three months worth of transactions at any given point in time that are live and can be compromised. And so uh, just for the people online, we're talking about uh, if you have a bunch of data that's coming in that you don't need immediate access to, you can kind of archive that off and put it into cold storage because maybe for fraud purposes or whatever reason, you know, audits or whatever, that you need to have, have the data available, you don't necessarily have to have it available now. So you, there are options to kind of remove it and put it into cold storage that you can get to if you need it, but you don't need it on the network all the time. And that kind of takes you into the extension of if we do proper network segmentation, if something does get compromised, something else doesn't get compromised. <laughs> so you're actually lowering your impact of what, what could possibly be either, you know, exfiltrated from your network or, you know, wiped out in some situations, you know. You, you basically, you know, if you segment your data off properly, you assume that if you get compromised, 
your compromise is going to be so low or the, the level of impact to your organization is going to be low enough that it may be more, you know, your risk on that might be low enough that it's an acceptable risk as an organization, you know, for that particular segment. You know, it gives you a, a better sense of security through the complexity of making that data accessible. So I'm just going to give you an example. We talked about the credit card data. Um, I used to work for a very large retailer uh, trying to get them uh, PCI compliant. <laughs> and all of our stores that were out there were, again, generating tons of credit card data. I mean, we were doing a significant volume of credit card data day to day. And that data would come in, and we started looking at, like, okay, where's the data coming in? Where's it going to? What's the data flow through the network? And I spent probably six months trying to map all that out, and eventually just threw my hands up. Literally, data was coming in off the register roll, off the uh, journal tape from the registers. Every department had access to it because certain departments would need, you know, sales needs to know what what's sold, and this other company needs to know what's sold, and this other this other division needs to know, you know, inventory numbers, and like all this different data that's contained in these uh, uh journal registers. Just anybody who needs it just got access to it, and they didn't really think to pare it down. Like, okay, well, you only need this specific kind of data, and you only need this specific kind of data. So when we looked at it, I mean, th this data was just all over the network, and there was no real good way of mapping it out because everybody had access to it. And that's the kind of stuff we're talking about, is you really need to think about what kind of data you have, who has access to it, and how do you pare that down to the minimum amount necessary for people to get their job done. Okay. I think also that a point needs to be made that, without a doubt, this has to, you have to accept this is going to be a complete and absolute continuously evolving process. Yeah, absolutely. It will be a complete and a, a absolute continual process that it is always ongoing. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, if you have a new data feed in, you have to figure out, okay, what is in this, where is it going, or where does it need to go, and at the minimum, what what needs to go where? You know, you can't just, you know, we we see it all the time, even in, you know, massive government organizations that we've all seen. You know, if you have access to that network, you have access to most of the data, at least most of the data on that, in that particular location that you're at. And yeah. it makes a huge risk because just because somebody doesn't have a proper access control to access it doesn't mean there aren't ways of compromising that data or getting access to it. <laughs> of uh, controlling that segmentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you got in mind to control it? How to track it? He said you spent a lot of time just trying to figure out well, where it is, yeah. <laughs> so, what if you come up with the hypervisor or whatever you got? Well, that is actually one of the things we're going to talk <laughs> about. Um, one of the ways we're talking about segmenting off your users and being able to control what they have access to um, I know, uh, uh, what is it, Citrix has a hypervisor solution where you can just say, okay, you only have access to Chrome, and that's it. So you can log in, you get access to Chrome, and you can get into your webmail, and you can get into these file sharing services, and that's it. And then you control that on a per-user basis. Uh, as far as the network segmentation stuff goes, there are some monitoring tools out there uh, that I've worked with, uh, some open source stuff, Puppet, uh, Chef. That will actually go to all your routers and hard uh, switches and firewalls, and will go. Okay, this config is supposed to be this. Log in. Yep, it is what it's supposed to be. Move on to the next one. Let's do that continuously. Right. And you can have a yeah. You can have a it? master list of like everything, every config the way it's supposed you think it's supposed to be, and it actually goes out and verifies that, and it'll alert you if it isn't. Yeah. Tripwire is another product. Yeah, that Tripwire is another product that that'll do that. Uh, even on a local workstation, it'll actually do file integrity checking and everything. Yeah. We it, use Bradford and. It's for some reason, get the wrong IP, DHCP, or even if you're antivirus that will start up the date, it immediately forces you into a quarantine network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only thing you, you have access to is a one-way connection to the browser, which will <laughs> say, oh, wow, we don't have that. Yep, you or your, yeah, if you connect up to, you said it's called Bradford? Okay, so yeah, and, and uh, Cisco has very similar products available that will actually do that and go, okay, your device doesn't meet this, 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 and this. I'm not going to let you talk to anybody until you talk to this guy over here who's going to give you patches and whatever else. How do you manage individual networks and know what? Wh I mean, so, I can see this, and that, that's a, 
there's a good way to do that, and we've always practiced, uh, you know, least amount of access. Mm -hmm. We know. Yeah, ideally. You know, you know, ideally. Yeah, and that's the problem. How do you know your policy is working? How do you know that is going on? There are some products from a firewall router switch um, standpoint that will go out and look at your network traffic from a metadata standpoint. So if, uh, if you have a rule at your firewall that says you can authorize this IP to communicate to this system, it will actually tell you how often that will actually trigger, and it will tell you if it's overly permissive for the actual service that is necessary. There's also one out there that will map out your entire network based on just your traffic alone, and it's not actually a net flow, which is really a, a much more complex way of managing it. This is more of a, it takes your configs, it knows exactly what network router switches communicate with each other, and then will actually, just based on the data flow, will actually map Okay, so this data goes to here, to here, to here, and it'll give you a nice graphical view of it. Now, these systems kind of look a little old, and some of them run on an old thick client that needs to run, you know, running. The others will rely on old Flash and things like that. They're, they're taking time to get going. They don't always look very good, and sometimes that is, it, it's a big turnoff for me when you have a product that can't even at least get to like HTML5 these days, <laughs> you know, and they've been around for 10 years, you know, things like that. But there are tools out there that will map that kind of traffic and allow you to get a really nice graphical representation of it. Uh, per device, right? Yes. On a per device or per network. You can configure anything you want into it, and it'll allow you. Segments and VPNs and mm -hmm. uh, to keep track of them and know who's yeah. supposed to be on them, whether they're flowing correctly. Yep. You know, they're yeah. Flowing. So more of a net net flow net flow analysis type of thing. Yeah. And that even helps with a uh, net flow analysis type of thing. Yeah. And that even helps with some of your performance management. You can say, hey, you know, usually this link is at twenty percent utilization. Today it jumped up to sixty for we don't know why. Yeah. It's running a uh, hundred users and now yeah. there's hundred and fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just all of a sudden, you came in the morning. It's like I mean, that's yeah, I mean, probably a security issue, but it's a performance issue too. And you're actually killing two birds with one yeah. stone if you start looking at some of this data. Yeah. They're expensive. Those yeah, kinds those... of tools are incredibly expensive. Some of them will even do deduplication of network traffic to pare down what you're actually your users are accessing. So you can take essentially like a T1 and make it act four or five times the performance of it because it will take that single data stream and allow you to not have to duplicate it out. It's it's very interesting technology. It'll also do compression, but it requires you to have a network sensor on all sides of your network and and every step in between in order to get true di you know, true you know, I guess uh value out of the product. So mm -hmm. um yeah, they're they're it's a tough sell, that's for sure. Especially when you can just double your capacity on your pipe and not even worry about it. It's you know for half well, the price. Yeah, yeah. Capacity so. has gone the way of hard drives. Mm -hmm. Just buy more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we have. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. And it's it's an issue mm -hmm. because a lot of that I don't know about these other guys, but probably thirty percent of my capacity is adware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hyper oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we see that a lot. And that becomes yeah. a security issue because these ad ad networks don't care. They are run by the lowest bidder, and we saw, I see them get hacked all the time. All the oh, time. Yeah. We, uh, it took us a, about a week to track down the Gazette, mm -hmm. who was rotating one ad out of every ten, yep. mm -hmm. ten ads. Oh, it took us forever to find that. Yep. Yeah. I have the exact same problem in the networks I manage, that so much adware that comes out of there. And it's just, if you want to look at uh, somebody's last ten minutes of their web surfing, it's 400 websites. Even though they've only visited maybe two or three. Right, there's two clicks. Yeah. 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 So when you talk about network segmentation, is have you seen a way to get that segmented off, or just completely stop it? Yeah, our solution is to get get your users off your network and let them have the wild wild west. And just if they need access to services, you can VPN in. That's yeah. the only thing we've really been able to come up with to manage that because it's you're not going to train your users to stop visiting websites. You it's can't. Just, That's the point with the phishing. So yeah. Yeah. You yep. Just, you you just can't. Can't control. Them. Yeah. That's educated and educated. Yeah. It's just it. <laughs> yeah, and yep. that that's one of the challenges that we have seen, but 
if you do network segmentation and their device does get compromised, it's not as big of a deal to, to triage that. You can go, right. hey, your, your device has malware on it. We're going to wipe it because, you know what, there's nothing on it that we're really worried about. Yep. Everything's so if you, over if here. If you go up to the cloud for all your data, if you use Google Drive, you don't have any local storage. You have no need for it. And there's free two-step verifications mm -hmm. that you can do for access control on these things. You know, Google Authenticator is an open product. Or you can do the universal two-factor from FIDO, which is a little computer key that you sit, you plug it in. Yeah, we all use one, these yeah. now. They're these very small. They act USB like a keyboard. Key. Yeah. And you plug those into your computer, and it will authorize that session. But the second that session is terminated, when the computer's off... If there's any compromise of the session at that point of the computer, it terminates the session to your critical data. And there are like thirty-five dollars each, but you can get them in a bulk order. Yeah, uh, UBT is actually really cool. We uh, we were at Black Hat this year and sat down with them for a little bit, and they're yeah. willing to work with anybody for yeah. bulk bulk prices. I mean, I can do like a dime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a, it. but there yeah. are software things. You know, Google Authenticator with a software token, it, it's free. You can implement yeah, that. Yeah, that. It's not, a, you know, it, all your users have to have a smartphone, or there are some text message based ones, or they can, if you don't have, if you can't receive text message, which is a little rare these days, you can actually have them just call you with a six digit code. You know, there yeah. are ways to get around I've that. I've seen some government agencies that are actually implementing, like, if you log in, it'll phone call you and go, okay, here's a six digit code, now you can log in. Yeah. Some, I, my, uh, Ant worked for an organization was doing that, and it was just in market research. You know, it, there there are things out there that, you know, so that work. So, what's some open source tools for segmentation management? Uh, segmentation management. Um, so yes. Right. <laughs> and full disclosure: I worked with Red Hat, but uh, okay. Red Hat and the upstream project over, uh, which is the downstream is Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. One of the ways we do it is the user can only access the portal. And that portal then says, which machine would you like to launch? And it says, my Windows box for internet browsing. And they click it, it opens the browser, and this box can talk to the internet. Because you have a lot of Google engineers you work with who can't function without Google, right? Mm -hmm. Google goes down and your network stops. Um, so you have to have Windows access to these guys. And then they have, oh, I have my work box. So I load that up, and that has access only to critical systems. Yeah. Right? And these are stateless machines. So when they turn them off, they They're completely it's yeah. blown away. It's so, like yeah. a VDI type VDI, of okay. Absolutely. So you yep. can do that. Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization or over. They're both free. Well, yep. they're not both free. They're free in the sense that the source is free. Red you pay for. It. Yeah. Virtual <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe VMware was working on something pretty similar to uh, that sort of thing where you just bring up your own an instance right. and do whatever you need to do, shut it down, and it goes away. Right. They're all in different network segments. So and it's a pool. So I say I want this segment basically fire up, and you only have access to that. So, like you said, with the, the browsing and all the viruses you have, who cares? Because yep. The machine disappears right afterwards. Yeah. Yep. Um, and the only access it has is to other stateless machines. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, I, I believe Amazon actually has a cloud-based VDI solution they've been working on in the Amazon, you know, web services, which is pretty crazy to think about. You know, you'll be able to stand up your users in the Amazon cloud. You can work anywhere, you know. Um, there, there's really cool technology out there that should allow us to solve this problem relatively, yeah. you know, trivial. It's definitely in the last four or five years, been some really neat technologies that have come online, but the problem is they're not for everybody. And yeah. If you're in a really remote area that doesn't have good bandwidth, that's not really going to be a, a viable solution. Yeah. Which is why we're thinking, you know, why don't you just cut the users out of, out of, the, out of the picture completely? Don't trust them. Have a Comcast business internet connection. That's all you get. Yeah. And then if you need access, sure. Yeah, and that's. Yeah. So there are people who are doing it at the ten thousand user level. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder, has anybody experienced a technology that will actually wipe out a, the hyperlink in an email? It, it force somebody to copy and paste it. Something like that, they're probably going to be less likely to actually click it. You know, things like yeah, that. I, no. You know, 
<laughs> well, you, you can't click it, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have the network to say you can't type. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's something I, I haven't seen. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. <laughs> Army networks control about three million. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys monitor how many people try to click it anyway. That might be interesting metric. You know, we we work. I, our, we've worked together at three employers now, um, and the previous one we worked on trying to come up with a case study that would allow us to create fake phishing schemes and then actually use demographics based on you know age and all that to try and you know anonymize it from the who you know is actually clicking it, but to give you some of that insight to you know and then of course it was like no, there's no way you're going to do that you know yeah, not yeah. here <laughs> nobody wants to know the answer to that that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoa! I knew I was going to do that. I did it last time. Military networks just for years not trusting the users, but at some point here in the last ten years, we got into you know we have to trust users to a degree. We have a huge insider threat problem on a grander scale. And so it's not so much we don't distrust users. It's we enforce. We disconnected. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. A, a PC term would be sanctions. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is there is a crime and punishment factor to not doing the things that you told. Mm -hmm. Do people still click on the links? Sure. Yeah. Do they still go to web try to go to the website they're not supposed to. Sure. But there is a there is a, a legal process whether you're a civilian, a contractor, or you're in uniform. For the uniform services, that if you do violate these uh, procedures and these regulatory issues, they're not based in legal law. That your job's going to suffer, and oh yeah, your clearance. But for some people, they that's a that's enough of a threat. Yeah, to, yeah, and that's a good way to enforce policy. That you know, you're going to lose your job. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes the non-technical enforcement of rules and consequences can help bridge some of that gap in some yeah. organizations, and maybe only at some levels, because in my experience in the military, you know, we've got the worker bees, the enlisted guys, we've got the officers, the middle managers, we've got the generals. Guess who the biggest offenders are at not listening to the rules? Yeah. The generals. <laughs> not many people are going to tell a general who's screwed up or fired. That's yeah. what happens. about 60% of those networks worldwide. Um, and in the Army, we have one large organization of several thousand people whose sole purpose in life is to operate and protect those networks. Mm -hmm. And they have branches, and just like the Army, it's a tiered structure and all mm -hmm. that. The organization I work for is kind of out here in this. Yeah, we don't know what to do with this. You're throwing the corner. <laughs> Every organization gets a set of rules to follow. If they don't implement them and they don't get caught, nobody knows. Yeah. But the rules are published, the consequences are published, those are enforced. The Sergeant Major in the Army works for a particular government organization known as ITA. And ITA, because they got all the generals, they kind of make up their own rules. So yeah, and that is a problem that people it, just kind of. I'm not going to follow your rules. Creating rules and then. Yeah, that's good for you. Do as I say, don't do as I do. Yeah. You know, kind of like parents. So, you know, it's kind of translated into the world. But, you know, 
be honest, you know, to be honest, those senior leaders, especially if you're in a highly technical organization that's operating in cyberspace exclusively, the senior leaders have very little impact on what's going on. They think they do. If you set the network up right, regardless of what you're doing or uh, if you are or not following your suggestions, senior leaders have very little impact. Mm -hmm. But they, but politically, as somebody else said, there's a political aspect of this, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of organizations I've been into where the CEO or CFO or whatever is like has domain access, domain admin, and they just ask for it, and nobody's going to tell the guy no. <laughs> so it sounds like uh, this is less about segregation, at least at the beginning, which your premise here, and more about shrinking your perimeter. Yeah, yes, yes. I guess segregation. It's still perimeter defense, it's just shrunk it down. Yeah. So it's, it's less from like protecting assets? Uh, the DHS CDM. CDM. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're plugged into that. Definitely. We are very much plugged into that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We actually work with a Booz Allen was given the contract on that. We actually work with them pretty regularly. Yeah. They're. We won't say anything. Yeah. Um. <laughs> just make one more comment. To what you guys are saying, uh, in my experience in the military. Layered defense. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And, you know, if you play video games, or you've been in law enforcement, or you've been in the security business, physical security business, or been in the military, you think in terms of layered defense, every layer you add will increase several fold the protection. Well, just especially the cost from the attacker's perspective to. Well, especially yeah. if you're alternating, you have to think of the goal. I'm coming down through the layers, and the first doorway is here. Second was over here, and the third was over here, yeah. and the fourth was over here. Takes a lot longer. Yep. Yeah. Opportunistically, it's it's much more easy to go target target. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Legitimate attacks. There's billions of attacks that are described. Okay. I was out of town when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, you would think you would have more uh, breaches than we do. Because we really don't have as many breaches as people think. Mm -hmm. Because we've got dozens of layers of security all across the world. No, so let's be honest, we have more breaches than we report. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're not <laughs> Every other organization, too. Yeah. But see, and this is just like a business thing. How many people die by the bottom line? The military lives and dies. Our bottom line just is a little different, that's all. But yep. it's just as important in the business world as it is in the military. Okay. No, I'm talking about saving lives, literally. Mm -hmm. You guys are talking about saving money, which saves employees' lives or investors' lives because we know what happens when everybody goes broke. Mm -hmm. So it's you know it's important in a different level. It's no less important on another level. Um, but it's that layered defense. If you think in that way, coming up with these ideas. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. They always say that no press is, uh, is bad press. <laughs> when it comes to a security breach, yep. it, all press is bad press. Well, yeah. you can, yeah, there's a way to let people know you have a problem without telling them what happened. But unfortunately, the fourth estate doesn't believe that. They think that everybody deserves to know what happened. Yeah. But what the gentleman sitting next to you was talking about was shrinking your perimeter. I think what they're really talking about is to add to it. Shrinking the perimeter is the end goal. You just shrink your perimeter to the data that you are currently holding, yep. and that is all. Because you compromise a workstation, that's fine. We'll kill it. It doesn't yeah, matter. It'll just, yeah, that it's all about... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all about... I'm sorry. You much better change of detection for your much, yeah. much smaller area. Yeah, you've got a much smaller perimeter to monitor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it makes it so that you can actually manage a security incident rather than 
run around with your hair on fire, you know? Yep. Or just it's, fill out endless freaking forms. Yeah. Yep. Incident response policy reports. Well, never mind all the tools that give you all the visibility in the workstation and everything. And, you know, been my experience, a lot of government, you get issued a laptop, you turn it on, you can walk away, go get a cup of coffee and come back and maybe it's done booting. Because yeah. it's got all this stuff on there to monitor everything you're doing. I just finished an internal pen test for PCI compliance for who I work for. And I, when I handed my boss a report, I was like, this is ridiculous. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you told me to simulate a normal user, but then you put restrictions on what I could do. <laughs> like, a normal user is going to go on Google if they want to compromise the network. They're going to go to Amazon. They're going to buy a hardware keylogger. They're going to plug it into the docking station with the keyboard. And then they're going to get help desk who's got <laughs> credentials that allow them to install programs, more than likely admin credentials, to install like Firefox or Chrome, yep. which doesn't even need management approval. And now they have the keys to the king. Yeah. Like, so instead, I'm sitting there and I'm scanning for days and days and days, and I'm trying to find Tomcat servers that are misconfigured <laughs> so that I can get user access and then dump the users and then decrypt the password hashes. Yeah, when all you got to do is put a hardware logger on it. Yeah. The whole time I'm doing this, the fire, the, not fire, the, the science department is getting email after email after email of alerts because everything is exploding. And they're just ignoring it because they know there's a test going on. Yeah. But what if it wasn't a test? They still can't manage it. Who's to say that with all of this scanning that I'm doing, there wasn't somebody three cubicles down who was doing the same thing? Yeah, excellent. And it just got <laughs> caught up in the wash because they're looking at such a large amount of right mm -hmm. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah, and I agree. Just uh, for the one of the networks I work on, we have uh, IDS alerts that we go through. We get 80,000 hits against them daily. And it's just drinking from a fire hose. I and mean, there's no way you can pair that down to anything useful. Yeah. yeah the, the, if you can lower the amount that you have to monitor, you also increase the ability to detect something when it is actually important. Decrease signal to noise ratio. Yeah. Get it to something more manageable. That's a good, that's a good statement. So how, how much do you decrease your, uh, your uh, alerting <laughs> on your... On the, when you start shrinking down that mm -hmm. perimeter, okay, you still got stuff out there. It still has to work. It's still having issues. So where, what is a threshold you think is 25% of, you know, there's an operational issue? I think it's very, very specific to the organization. Because if, you're, I mean, if yeah. you're, what, Facebook, and you have more servers and more actual, you know, IP connections than you have employees... And then, how how do you do that? How, what does actually doing that provide in you know in terms of reduction in that visibility? But you do only have a handful of ports that you have to monitor. So that that in it itself, you know, if, if they put the walls up around their critical infrastructure, then they only have to monitor the in, the egress and ingress at a, a small number of, of of actual points. Alert wise, you may still have a you know a ton, but you can at least pare it down to you know. A, a very small number of of locations where you have to really be concerned about, you know. But it's going to be dependent on the kind of data you're trying to protect. If you're look, like looking at credit card data, you can get that down to a small number of systems. That credit card data is only stored in like these four servers. But if you're looking maybe health data, maybe that's on these servers over here, and you got a little bit wider because you have a lot of employees, and they got all that. Or you have financial data for employees. It's going to be very data dependent and risk driven. So you're saying for each data store, you evaluate it on what your thresholds are mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Some might be a lot more. Some you might want to have more robust alerts capabilities in place and others. Like, well, you know, that's not super important. We can monitor kind of maybe more basic stuff and we don't have to go nuts with it. Draw a comparison to old school. Think about the first time you set up a smart box. Like, you turn that thing on and all of a sudden you're <laughs> flooded. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you practically oh my god, we're being hacked! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Down, yep. And with every time you pare down a chunk, you've got to then look at what comes in and figure: Are we missing something that's important? And you've got to look at that. And then you pare it down more until you get to the point where it's tuned to just what you want to see, and you have good 
at least I'd say 80 percent confidence yeah. that you're not missing something that you might want. And that's the problem. You're that's still that's only that's looking for things you think you want to see. The, un the unknown unknowns. <laughs> I like that number he threw out, 80%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I could get a store box tuned to 80% of what I wanted, I would, uh, I'd be happy with what he did. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. My man's going to fire me to heartbeat because he'd be like, you're a liar. <laughs> How you're going to threshold and the percentage of protection that gets to 80%. I don't understand that. Really? I just threw that number out as, because in my mind, if you could tune out and get eight and be guaranteed get 80% of what you're looking for, you would be so far ahead of the game. Like, I, I would say, uh, we've been, like I said, we've been working on this very similar to what they're talking about for about six years now. Yeah. Uh, we've had everything, but even just this last week, when I was doing the testing, like we have, we, we run Imperva as a WAP, which is a great product. And it blocks cross-site scrapping across the board, boom, did it, boom, did it, boom. I hit a web server, and I base 64 encoded <laughs> on my script. And it's it invisible. It yep. yep. My boss lost his mind at me. <laughs> because what that just did was generate a whole huge amount of more work for him. Well, you just pointed out the emperor has no clothes. He realizes that what we thought was going on is not what is going on. And that is why what I said earlier, it has to be a constant process. You have to keep on hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And every time you think you've got it to where you want it, uh, <laughs> yeah, the goalposts just moved. Yeah, the goalposts just moved. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they took care of the basic floor encoding issue. They, it was a quick fix. But that just goes to show a fix that literally takes less than an hour to implement after approval, which took five hours, which is what's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> because we all know it's going to go to the VP of risk management, and it's going to go to the their yeah, boss. Yeah. Every little thing you do is going to help. But the thing that's going to help the most is every problem you find. No matter how bad it seems, no matter how much you're going to beat yourself up at the end of the day, oh my god, we haven't been doing this for how long? Okay, yeah, fine, you haven't. There's nothing you can do about that other than move forward and... Yeah, stop. and that's why I don't like getting caught up in statistics that we, you know, we blocked 10,000 attempts today. What does you that mean? You only need one. Yeah, what does <laughs> one that mean? to get in. Yeah. Or another way, uh, we blocked 10,000 attempts. Yeah, but you got hit eight and a half million times. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the statistics never give you a real view of, of what the, you know, what your reality is. And that, that's the biggest problem. It, that, I mean, I hate to say it, it only takes one, but it doesn't matter if it's one or if it's a hundred. If you segment your network properly, if you isolate your users, if that one gets compromised, you don't worry about the, the catastrophic consequences of that one anymore. Well, statistics are the third biggest lie. Yep. And what you just said is very important. Yep. I mean, lies, damn lies, and statistics. I used, I used a very simple, like the simplest of simple cross descriptive. I just wanted to generate an alert box. Because yeah. why the hell write long amounts of code if you don't have to? <laughs> but if it's going to do that, it's going to take who knows how many lines that would literally compromise everything and ship it to China or some yep. donkey college student in Ohio who's Hey, hey, I grew up in Ohio, okay? <laughs> well, if you actually scan and trace most of their origins, the vast majority of them now actually occur from college students in the Midwest. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> well, I got a question for you. Yeah. Have you ever had a risk management analysis on a segmentation theory of, of protecting data? We've been able to sell yeah, an organization yeah. to want to put the investment in. 
You know, we've been talking about this for, for years. Several years now, yeah. But it's nearly impossible to take an organization, and a lot that we work with are very large, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah Kickstarter. <laughs> it would be, I, we would love to have that answer, you know, and that's why we wanted to engage in a dialogue to see what everybody yeah. is experiencing, you know. Or, or, we don't want to, like, tie ourselves to a certain type of technology. We want it to be as agnostic yeah. as possible. So. I think that that would go a long way of getting some into this, but it's like you said, get it done. Yeah. You're too busy trying to protect the network. No. Nope. Yeah. We, we don't have time. We have too many attacks. Yep. Yeah. We've got yeah, sort of a stand up a skunk works for. <laughs> you know, I don't think that uh, you bring up a good point. Yeah, five minutes. I think that the uh, people who are creating and managing these businesses are doing in the organizations that being able to uh, yeah. properly handle the technology. I'll tell you one better. Most organizations, be it small business to enterprise, to, to quite a lot of enterprise business, enterprise at least isn't as bad, most of them still look at security as, as just a call strain. Yeah, it's a redheaded like, stepchild. Well, just and and I think the biggest challenge is is that most large enterprises are very short term thought on yep. their bottom line now. Their CEO is going to get thirty million to leave the company after he doesn't put the money into something. It doesn't matter. They get a golden parachute. Yeah, so and, why spend the money on security when eh, it doesn't matter to me? I'll still be rich yeah. when I'm done. And but the retail uh, organization I work with, you know, I'd sit down with the CEO is well, what's the ROI in doing all this security? And I'm like. None. That there isn't one. This is loss prevention. Yeah. But there's the answer to that is depends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is, yeah. and, and that's actually th th that came up a lot at uh, Black Hat this year was insurance over data breaches. But at some point, these companies aren't going to just insure you because you give them money. They're going to want to come in and actually audit and make sure you at least have some securities in place. That's already started. It's, with a lot of the yeah. organizations do like like us like our insurance. If we don't get, like I said, I just did the uh, the internal. If we don't get our rock, so to speak, from PCI, mm -hmm. our yeah, insurance is suspended. Yeah, because our insurance company is not going to throw good money after bad. No, yep. and uh, hopefully we get it because otherwise, if we don't, I'm probably going to get fired. <laughs> that's, that's a different that's a different conversation. For but yeah, there a lot of insurance companies start to wise up with this. Like they're not just taking money. A couple, even as much as a year or two ago, what they would pay out was a tiny fraction of what they were taking in. Now they're it's getting more expensive. That these breaches yeah, they're... are drastically larger in financial impact than what they expect, and they're not. They're not. Yeah, they're going to want to pay out. Yeah. They're not willing to risk that money unless they know. And There's at least some due diligence in there, yeah. Have insurance for that because I mean, not only will it destroy your company reputation, something that involves PCI, you're not going to be able to actually conduct business if you don't have a that rock and b that insurance to back it up. Well, I mean, you look at Target; everybody's still shopping there. Yeah. But they also, and to the end user, because their bank has to issue them a new credit card, it's not the end of the world. Oh, yep, no, this is, it's it's annoying, yeah. but it's already happened four times this year, so it doesn't really matter. It's the it's going to get to the point, <laughs> or yeah. six. Yeah. 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 Shop at the store that yeah, didn't it well. didn't take the due diligence. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about the rest of you, but I was far. But after Target got breached and they did their evaluation, or anything, I was far more comfortable. I was far more comfortable shopping at the, with them <laughs> about three months after that <laughs> than I had with pretty much anybody else. Because the moment something like that happens, then it becomes real. Yeah, yep. and then what you see is a huge influx of dollars to security. The problem is getting these, these organizations to do that influx and yeah, take before the <laughs> before that happens. 
Yeah. yeah. So um, we're out of time, but I don't know if we have any Top Gear fans in here. But on on that bombshell, I think what we've learned today is is that the best security is to get breached first. <laughs> so, <laughs> but thank you. You guys have been awesome. And this, yeah, we'll be at the dinner tonight. So if anybody wants to chat and yeah. come up and. Uh, and Brandon's talking next. Yeah, the next um, course is going to be uh, Security Onion and how to set it up and get it configured and all sorts of fun you. stuff. And then uh, tomorrow at, what, 10, 10 9 a.m., yeah. we're going to do a, uh, a talk on a prank that we uh, wrote a number of years ago um, for Windows and uh, it's kind of the security yeah, sort of aspect our experiences of it. Of it. So um, it's, it's all about My Little Ponies. And, and so I uh, <laughs> hope to see you guys there because that one's going to be a lot of fun. So thank cool. you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.